Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of Humperdinck Productions podcast. What we're going to cover in this episode is we're going to meet one of our Hansels and one of our Gretels from the cast of Hansel and Gretel. Um, and we're going to get a basic historical context of the show so we know what's going on and all of the fun things that have happened with productions and the story of Hansel and Gretel in the past. So this is McKenna. Um, Stephanie, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Stephanie Chi. I'm a third year soprano at Northwestern, and I will be playing the role of Gretel. In this particular production, we have three different Hansels and three different Gretels in the main cast, and then another children's cast, which is very exciting. Um, Opus at Northwestern is about expanding opportunities for undergraduate and for graduate students as well. And for this particular production, um, there, the music is a little bit hard, uh, not a little bit, a lot hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so the choice was made to split the acts, also to make it easier for our audio engineers, I believe Kevin and Paige, or yeah, um, to edit and put it all together and make it into this like pretty tied up project. Um, but I guess a little more about me. Um, I really like to cook. I've found that I really have a passion for cooking this quarantine and um, I've been making meals like almost every day in my apartment and baking every weekend because Wait, I- Wait, what's your favorite thing to cook and to bake? Oh, that's really hard. Um, <laughs> I, I really make, I really love pasta, which ties into my other fun fact. Or I like making Italian food and I really like making Asian food and like bringing things from home. So. I have this like incredible recipe for teriyaki chicken that is so good. And then um, I also, I made these like pumpkin mini hand pies right before I Oh left. my gosh. And they were so good. Like I don't even like pumpkin and they were good. <laughs> but anyways, I digress. Um, <laughs> another fun fact about me is that I really love languages and um, I've kind of made it my goal through life also through Northwestern to really delve into the lyric languages. So I've studied Italian. I actually run an Italian language group online. Like on What? Facebook. That's yeah, so I did. cool. Well, if you want to join, it's Italian language practice hosted by Stephanie Chin. We do three sessions a week where we just kind of speak Italian because I'm not taking an Italian class this quarter and I really want to just keep up my language skills. Um, I just started taking German. I have some background in French and I'll take that next year as well. Um, and I'm also right now doing an independent study on the particularities of diction with, or like the intricate complexities and differences of diction within the different languages. So for that, I'm analyzing and comparing German, French, Italian, English, Russian, Swedish, and Norwegian. And um, in the process of putting together like a, a big paper with some audio recordings to help of comparing like how the phrasing goes and how these different sounds happen in the mouth for singers, particularly for me, but for all singers and how we adjust them on the way up and down. So that's that's quite a bit about me. I think you know a lot about my life story now. <laughs> um, so that is so be. cool. <laughs> oh my gosh, is, are you a future diction professor? You know, I don't know. I'd love to have an opera career first, but I do love my languages. Like, it's my goal to, like, I really want to be a polyglot. I think that's what you call it. Like, the people who, like, just can, like, switch languages back and Whoa. forth. And um, I love speaking languages, and I love singing in languages, and I love reading. And, like, I just love everything to do with languages. I'm a really big nerd, if you can't tell, <laughs> about languages. Um, and this is a, a fun fact. I haven't, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this officially, but um, I am going to do an ad hoc major. I'm pursuing an ad hoc major at Northwestern. I haven't declared it, but it's in like operatic languages. So that'll be pretty cool to graduate with a double major in vocal performance and lyric languages. <laughs> That's really, really cool. That's so exciting. I'm interested in pursuing an ad hoc major at Northwestern as well. Um, oh, really? Wow. What in? 
Um, Northwestern doesn't really have a business major and I don't really like a traditional business major. Um, so I was thinking about making an ad hoc major for running a small business or social movements or something like that. Um, just to get all the practical skills because I love practicality um, in a way that makes sense. <laughs> That's so cool. You should definitely pursue it. I yeah. mean, for any prospective students or current students at Northwestern, the um, whole like advising department is so helpful. And just like Northwestern is a school, they're so been in, they're so open to you creating your own path and you getting where you want to go and becoming the best, most well-rounded musician and person that you can be. So if there's not a major in there and you want to study something like lyric languages for me and like the small business things for McKenna, you can pursue it. And you just talk to Dean Jacobs and she figures your life out and it's incredible. Yes. Oh, good promo for being in. <laughs> All right. Lauren, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, I am a third year junior um, mezzo soprano in Teresa Brancaccio's studio. I am singing Hansel in the second act of Hansel and Gretel. Um, let's see. Besides doing music, which is, well, besides doing music, I was going to say, um, I've been getting back into playing the piano, which is music. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so I've I've been you know with with all the extra time that I've had, I've been diving back into playing the piano because I played for like twelve years and then I. I had no idea. Yes, and so I've been doing that, and it's been fun. It's been a process getting it back into my fingers, um, and I also picked up a sculpting hobby like over the the pandemic course. <laughs> Um, so I've been doing a lot of that. These are Northwestern students, everybody. <laughs> that is so cool. Like sculpting, like rocks. No, um, with my, mostly natural clay sculpting. Oh, um, yeah, that's been mainly my thing. That's so cool. Oh my gosh. Oh. Maybe we can do a social event for the cast where you show people how to sculpt. <laughs> That would be cool. That would be really fun. I would go. Okay, we're going to plan it for next weekend. It's incredible. I know the viewers can't see, but... Oh my gosh, for everyone listening, Lauren just held up a vase or a mug, which is it? I, I use it as a vase, but it could be a mug. Beautiful sculpted hand as part of it, as the handle almost. Very, very <laughs> cool. <laughs> very good pun if it was intended. <laughs> handle yeah <laughs> we can't handle it it's so <laughs> <cool>. <laughs> all right so yeah that's them they're wonderful their singing is absolutely beautiful um and yeah they're some of the more experienced folks of the cast as well so next that we're going to do is i'm going to give you a little bit of background on the show and then we're going to have stephanie read the story that um Edelheid Vett, the person who wrote the libretto for this show, um, included in the beginning of the score. The historical context is, if this is somewhat debated, um, Lauren and I were both doing research and we came up with different answers, but the one that I found um, and would like to lean towards because a lot of the times when women sort of wrote things or composed things in the past, um, they put it under their husbands or brothers or somebody else's name it ended up being under because that's the only way it would sort of get into popular um, consumption. But anyhow, so Edelheid Witt um, came up with the idea of writing songs based on the Brothers Grimm fairy tale Hansel and Gretel. So what I read is that she wrote songs for her children to perform and then approached her brother Engelbert Humperdinck about composing music for a full opera of it. Um, and it ended up being with the opera, as we know, that the final libretto, which is just the script or the words to the show, basically, was written by Edelheid and the final music by um, Engelbert. So when I was, and I, I found this same story on two different sources, um, which was that she brought these four folk songs to Engelbert to write for her children for Christmas um, or, or arrange for the children to be able to sing as a Christmas present, which I suppose they didn't say that she didn't write them, but the way mm. that it was worded was insinuating that she just found these folk songs that she wanted. Oh, yes. And Hansel and Gretel is based a lot off of folk mm -hmm. songs. 
And so he did that, and then he expanded it into a play with multiple musical numbers. And then from there, he expanded it into the full opera. Um, I think at the, um, one of his colleagues, you know, had seen the play that he wrote and said, hey, you should, you should make this into a full scale opera. And at first he was like, well, I don't know if Hansel and Gretel is a long enough score or not score, um, story to turn into a full opera, but um, he did, and I'm glad he did. <laughs> The music is just absolutely beautiful. I can't wait for you guys to hear it when you listen to the opera on December 12th. Uh, all right, so that's the basic historical context. Um, so Stephanie, do you have the story? Um, will you read it to us? Sure, I'd love to. Once upon a time, there was a poor couple, a broom maker and his wife, who had two children. The boy was called Hansel and the girl, Gretel. One day, the parents had gone tramping over the country to try and dispose of their goods. On leaving the children, the mother had given them the last bit of bread that was in the house and had told them to be very industrious while she was away. It was not long before the lively children tired of their work and began to get hungry till Hansel was on the point of crying when Gretel came to the rescue and cheered him up again. So they sang and danced till they both forgot their hunger and work. And at last, in tremendous spirits, they tumbled over one another on the floor. Now, it happened that just at this moment, the mother came home again, tired and out of sorts, for she had not taken a single farthing and consequently had brought home nothing to eat. When she found the children sitting on the floor and making ever such a noise, instead of being quietly at their work, she got very angry and drove them out with blows into the wood hard by. They were not to come back until they had filled their basket with strawberries. Then she sank warily down on a chair and dropped asleep from hunger and fatigue. The children soon got happy again over their strawberry picking and did not notice that they were losing their way and getting deeper and deeper into the wood, until at last they halted by the Ilsenstein, Ilsenstein, I think. Full of fun and high spirits, they imitated the cuckoo's cry and accused him of turning his little ones out of their nest and eating the eggs of other birds. And as they imitated him in this, making the strawberries take the place of the eggs, their basket unawares got empty. Meanwhile, it got gradually dark and the children became frightened. They could not find their way and wandered helplessly around. The wood seemed full of ghosts and the trees rustled in an uncanny fashion. The birds were all silent and only the cuckoo was still heard in the far distance. But from the Ilsenstein, there arose queer shapes in the mist, so that the poor, lonely children were frightened out of their wits. They cowered under a great fir tree to try to find shelter from the terrors of the night, until the Sandman, who comes at night to strew sand over people's eyes to send them to sleep, appeared and quieted them with kindly gestures. Then. After they had said their usual evening prayer to the 14 angels, they lay down and went to sleep on the soft moss. And the 14 angels hovered around and watched over the good children so that no harm might come to them. The next morning, they were awakened from their dreams by the little dew man, whose business it is to run over the hills and fields, awakening everything that is still slumbering. And what should they see before them? But a little house all made of cakes and sugar candy and glistening in the light of the sun and smelling so delicious that the hungry children who could scarcely believe their eyes were quite wild with the delight. They cautiously approached the cottage and as they did not see anybody about, they became bolder and broke a piece off of the wall, which tasted exceedingly nice. At this moment, a voice was heard from within the house saying, Nibble, nibble, mousekin, who's nibbling at my housekin? At first, they were rather alarmed, but they soon regained their courage and called to one another that it was only the wind, the wind, the heavenly wind, and went on nibbling. 
but the door of the cottage softly opened, and a very old and ugly woman came out of it. Now there was something very wicked about this old creature. She was a witch who rode on a broomstick through the air at night, and in the daytime enticed little children into her sugar house, where she popped them into the oven and made them into gingerbread, which she afterwards ate. She tried to be friendly with Hansel and Gretel and coaxed them in with honeyed words. However, the children distrusted the poor old woman and tried to run away. Then the, rich, then the witch raised her magic wand and spellbound them both, so that they were rooted to the spot. She next took Hansel and shut him up in a stable and fed him with almonds and raisins to make him fat. She was so delighted when she had done this that she seized a broomstick and rode wildly on it around her house. After that, she called Gretel and told her to look into the oven and see if the cakes were done. But Gretel was sharper than the witch and saw through her little dodge, so she pretended to be very stupid and begged the old woman to show her how it was to be done. The old woman unsuspectedly bent down over the oven to show Gretel what to do and peeped in. No sooner had she done this than the children gave her a good push and in she tumbled. They quickly shut the iron door and left her to bake in her own oven while they danced away in good earnest. Suddenly, a crack was heard and the magic oven fell to pieces with a loud crack. And behold, the gingerbreads, which were standing in a row round the cottage, were transformed into living pretty creatures living pretty children who joyfully surrounded Hansel and Gretel and thanked them for their happy release. And what joy when the sorrowing parents appeared and Hansel and Gretel rushed delightedly into their arms once more. Then all sadness and want were, bearished, were banished forever, for the, in the sugar cottage they had found all sorts of treasures which would make them happy and rich for the rest of their days. And they all thanked God who had taken care of them in their great need. The end. Oh, thank you so much. That was such a beautiful reading of that story. <laughs> On that wonderful note, um, that's what's to expect in the opera on Saturday, December 12th. Um, and it's gonna be amazing. That wonderful storytelling is what all of our cast are doing and every word that they sing throughout the show. Um, it only runs a little under 90 minutes, um, but every single part of it is extraordinarily beautiful. Um, it's been one of the favorite operas I've ever heard. I don't know about you guys, but because of the folk tunes, it's just so gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I agree. I love this music. It's so lush and exquisite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so now that you guys know the story, um, Lauren had some really interesting facts and in, in knowledge about the show. So Lauren, you want to just tell us all of them? Yeah. Well, first, um, some of these are just about Humperdinck as a, as a man in general. So um, he was a composer in the late 19th century in Germany, and he was friends with Wagner and Mahler and Strauss, Richard Strauss. And um, and so he actually was, as a young man, the assistant to Wagner. Um, and you can actually really hear that uh, influence on, on Humperdinck's music in this opera with just the massive orchestration and beautiful, oh my gosh, some of the or orchestra parts like the witch's dance are so fun. It's and so, so good. It it's actually the witch's ride, which has a little share, some thematic material with the witch's dance, is the music that you hear in the intro and extra um, or outro of this podcast. Oh, yay. Cool. <laughs> um, and um, so some little fun fact or a fun story about when he was working with Wagner is um, when they were rehearsing Parsifal. Um, there was a point when Humperdinck and one of his friends jumped on stage during the rehearsal and sang the flower maiden scene, uh, jo just joking around. And Wagner said, well, if we can't have flower maidens, I suppose we will take radish boys. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Humperdinck is a radish boy. He's a radish boy. <laughs> um, 
Um, <laughs> another fun story um, about the debut of Hansel and Gretel is the um, the woman who was supposed to debut Hansel was actually one of Strauss's um, students. She was a soprano, um, and the at the dress rehearsal she was so excited. She was just bouncing all around the stage, apparently, so much so that she hurt her ankle and she sing in the first couple of performances. And so another woman had to make a cancel for her. And then she joined in, I think, the third performance. <laughs> oh my God. This is so relatable, unfortunately, but <laughs> poor woman, poor soprano. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I could just see what performing in like the 1800s looked like. Not to mention yeah. the shoes that women had to wear back then. Like, I don't know. Like, how would you have jumped around? Like, I mean, kudos to her for not getting more hurt. But True. Like, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, those were awesome. Um, on that note, it's about time that we start wrapping up the podcast. Um, so as always, I'll remind you, our listeners, that if you enjoy this, if you're looking forward to the show... Um, We'd really love if you donated to the organization that we're partnering with, A Just Harvest. They are making a ton of a difference, especially in COVID times um, in Rogers Park in Chicago. And when our show releases, we're not asking for any money, any donations for our organization. We were able to cut all of our costs this quarter because we're remote. So all we want is for you to donate even a couple dollars to A Just Harvest, a meal, for one person there ranges from $1.50 to $3. So even if you donate like $3, um, half of your Starbucks latte, probably, <laughs> um, you're feeding somebody for a day that otherwise would not have access to nutritional or healthful food. So anything that can help them, especially right now when people, a lot of places don't have the resources to donate would be just really helpful. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you so much, Lauren and Stephanie, for being here. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. Um, Yeah. Thank you, McKenna. Yeah. (laughs) Have a great day, everyone. (laughs) 